So this is actually several talks together, and I have several names for my talk. So this is the easiest one for us to work with, but you're going to discover other names for the talk as we go through. Um, preview one of them. My favorite is actually Undercover Laravel, but I thought it was a little bit too cheesy to do for the whole thing. So right now it's going to be sharing Laravel, bringing Laravel's best assets to any project you're working on. So I'm Matt Stauffer. I'm at Stauffer Matt on Twitter um, because some realtor has at Matt Stauffer and I haven't persuaded him to give it to me yet. Um, I'm partner and technical director at Titan Co., which is a web, -based, a web consultancy based out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I'm from Gainesville, Florida, which means I'm from the American South which means I'm probably going to say y'all a lot. And if you're not familiar with that, that's kind of like you, but you, you all, y'all. So just so you're prepared, that's what I mean when I say that. So the question that we have to ask at any point where we're going to give a talk and when you're submitting a talk proposal is, why is this even worth your time? Was it worth my time to put together? Why is it worth your time to sit here? Um, the thing is, the majority of Laravel tutorials, talks we're going to hear, even Jeffrey Way's incredible Laracast, they always assume that you have a blank slate that you're working with. This means Greenfield, which is the project that you're working on has no prior constraints. You get to do whatever you want. Amazing architecture, domain-driven design, all this kind of stuff. Great, go at it. But the problem is the vast majority of our work is actually on pre-existing code bases. As a result, we don't always get to implement those things the way we want. This is what actually our life looks like. Old code is the vast majority of it. And we have this tiny little slice of freedom in which we get to do all these wonderful things. Half the time that's open source and it's not actually our day job anyway. So the solution is to learn how to bring the best assets of the Laravel world infrastructure ecosystem to all of those projects, not just the few that give us all the space. Maybe it's an old Laravel project, maybe it's some other project that you're working on. Two disclaimers. First, I'm going to cover a lot, and so I have to cover it all shallowly. I hope shallowly. I hope that you hear little things and say, I want to learn more about that. I want to learn more about that. Ask me afterwards. Ask a lot of other people here who are a lot smarter than me, but like write it down, look at the slides later, and dig deeper into those things. I'm not going to dig deep enough into anything for you to really understand it all. And second of this disclaimer is a lot of this isn't unique to, to Laravel. So I'm not going to say, hey, PSR is really great, and Laravel invented PSR or interfaces or whatever else. We didn't invent those things, but they're things that we can learn from the Laravel community. You're here, so let's learn them together. So first question, if we're talking about taking the good things about Laravel elsewhere, we're going to understand what are the good things about Laravel. I want to take this in the context of imagining a particular older project that you're working on and saying, what will Laravel add to this project? So first of all, modern coding practices. The best practice is modern PHP. We're talking about you know, code standards and design patterns, all this kind of stuff. Bring that together. Number two, rapid app development. Like Rails, like CodeIgniter and Laravel, you come up with an idea, you implement the idea, very short period of time. Number three, a collection of great community packages. Symphony packages uh, and 4.3, we're going to have Fly System, a lot of the other things that other people are doing either are already in Laravel or play very nicely with Laravel. But we also have a lot of original packages. The Illuminate packages are some of the best at what they do that have, we have available. A thriving and positive community. I think this is the most undersold value of Laravel that it brings to the PHP community, the developer community in whole. It's positive, it's inclusive. It is, uh, it's just a good place to be. It's encouraging, it's teaching, and that's not always the case. And I think that's something that Taylor has done intentionally since day one, and we really benefit it from it even when we don't realize it. Um, adoption of advanced patterns and practices, um, especially if you follow you know, the Sean McCools and Laravel I.O. and all those kind of folks, you're gonna see people talking about stuff that's definitely some, you know, it's not as if we're like inventing new things, but you're gonna hear stuff over the next few days and when you follow those folks, it's like, hey, this is kind of pushing the boundaries of what a lot of people in web development are thinking about. And that is a part of the Laravel community. And so that's a good thing that, that pushes us in those directors, directions. And finally, the potential for future growth. It's not just that Laravel is good as it is. It's getting better. And we can see that something that's unique about Laravel and its ecosystem is that it was forward thinking already. And we expect it to continue to be forward thinking. So it's not that we're committing to something that's great now that's going to stagnate for the next 10 years. We have the hope that it's going to continue developing and growing. And again, we can bring all these things elsewhere. But Matt, you, dear audience members, say, my current project is CodeIgniter slash fuel slash whatever. Uh, include mess, terrible PHP from 10 years ago, PHP 4. What do I do? Why don't I just rewrite the whole thing in Laravel? And I want to tell you, this is a terrible idea. Capital T, capital I, don't do it. This is because our normal response to legacy code, which we didn't write or us three years ago who didn't know anything wrote or whatever it ends up being, who's pretty much another person anyway, that idiot that I was three years ago who didn't know how to write code like I do now. We want to trash it or more likely we want to kill it with fire. <laughs> Nuking your old project is a bad idea. You don't want to do it, I promise you. I've done it. I've seen other people do it, and never has it been a good idea. First of all, 
it's going to take a lot longer than you think. This rule of estimation, uh, the, my favorite rule of estimation that I've ever heard is take however long you think it's going to take, add one, multiply it by two, and then move it up to the next amount of time. So you think it's going to take one day, add a day, two days, multiply it by two, four days, and then move it up the next unit of time. So you think it's going to take one day, it's going to take four weeks. That's just like a reasonable way to do things. Some other people use the multiply by pi rule, so take whatever you think it's going to be and multiply by 3.14159, blah, 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 blah. That's fine, but I like this one better because it's more realistic. Number two, it's going to take longer than you think. I promise you, you don't understand how much is going to go on. And, and a lot of this is because every application that you have has a lot more domain knowledge embedded within it than you ever understand. You look at your existing app and you say, there's a couple models, there's a couple controllers, there's a couple this, oh, there's a command bus here, there's whatever. I can rewrite all those in X amount of time. First of all, you're bad at estimating that. But second of all, there's a lot of little quirks and little tiny little bits that we're unable to really understand are there until we have to rewrite them and we re-encounter the bugs that somebody fixed three years ago that we didn't remember was there. So unless you have this amazing tested code base and you can write against your tests, in which case you probably don't need to rewrite in the first place, you are going to break almost everything because you don't understand all the knowledge that's embedded in there. Um, the next piece is usually when you throw assets at this redevelop, your old site stagnates. You think it's going to be for a day, it's going to be four months, but re or four weeks. But really, you think this project's going to take three months, it ends up taking two years, and the development on your active project that actually gets used and that your business actually cares about totally shuts down, bug fixes die, development die. So you think you're doing something great, but the reality of the rest of the world is you've stagnated. So pretty much across the board, this is a bad idea. Finally, it's going to take longer than you think. <laughs> so instead, we're going to work with the incremental approach. Um, I've been doing this on my own for a while, but Paul Jones in his talk, which is, a, it, it's, uh, it was like that when I got here, and also in his book, Modernizing Legacy, App, Legacy Applications in PHP, he describes it in a way which I really appreciate, which is make one change across the entire code base, write the tests, send it off to QA, and once you're good, you commit it, and then you do the same thing over and over again. One small incremental thing, test it, QA it, commit it, repeat, over and over and over and over again. It doesn't feel very glamorous, but I promise you, this is the way to do things. And so we are now going to do <laughs> Undercut Laravel. I wanted this to play like a spy secret agent theme song, but I didn't know how to do that. So instead, you can just appreciate my Photoshop skills. So there's a book called Undercover Your User Experience Design. I actually come from design and UX and front end, and not from the back end world. And so this was a really fantastic book for me. Because what the guy said was, and this is five, ten years ago, user experience design is new. Okay, we don't know this design. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have our bosses even expecting that you're going to hire a UX person. Now, now, these days, it's a little different. But back then, how are you going to get UX going in your organization? And he said, do it undercover. And what that means is learn everything you can about UX design, by reading my book, of course, um, and then go in piece by piece to every single project that you do, every single group that you're a part of, and sneak in a little bit of UX in there. And maybe you have to work nights and weekends to prove that this is valuable and you won't be able to be paid for it. Or maybe you will, you know, not necessarily overestimate, but maybe you find the way to do something else a little bit faster so you can sneak a little bit of user experience design in here. And by doing that, you're going to have the opportunity to prove to your business that this is something valuable. And then next time you say, remember how valuable that was? And they'd say, yes, you're right. Give me some resources for it. Give me some time for it. Hire me full time as a UX person. Okay, so we're going to do that for Laravel. So, recognizing that an all-out rebuild is a terrible idea, but still wanting to bring the best of Laravel or best of modern PHP to my project, become a Laravel secret agent. Sneak a little bit of it in when it's least expected. So you write a test there, you do a little bit of direct injection there, maybe you're going to bring an Illuminate component there, and piece by piece, iteratively, bring these things in to modernize your code bases. Prove the value of modern PHP. Prove the value of Laravel. Prove the value of Illuminate components. Prove the value of all these things before you're asking somebody to pay for it, or at least pay for an entire restructure for it. So if you've got those older developers that we were talking about that are saying, no, I don't want to deal with this. Okay, that's great. Show them why it's great. Don't try and hit them over the head with it. Show them why it's great and bring them on board, because I promise you that the first time someone in that space starts seeing the way that, for example, Composer transforms your code base, unless they are just absolutely idiotic, in which case you might want to consider replacing them, they will start to see the value piece by piece by piece. Um, and finally, um, look for, yeah, I already said that one. Okay. Seven steps to Laravelizing your coding and your legacy code base. Now, I recognize that by calling this Laravelizing, someone might say, are you saying that Laravel is responsible for infrastructure patterns like DDD? No. I'm saying these are things we can learn from the Laravel community. So number one, learn the basics. Um, crap code wrapped in Laravel is still crap code. You can write bad code in Laravel. People do it all the time, unfortunately. I do it as well, okay? 
So instead, before we even talk about Laravel and Illuminate and all that kind of stuff, we want to talk about how do we bring best coding practices just as coders. So I come from front end, right? So I don't have a computer science degree. I didn't learn, learn a lot of these things about best coding practices. And so coming to Laravel was actually the space in which I learned them. And I know that I'm not alone in that. So for example, you'll want to learn the basics of object-oriented programming. Go learn what solid means. Learn each of them. Learn them extremely well. Have the transformation that happens in your mind where rather than somebody else telling you object-oriented programming is really good, you realize and you have that epiphany where you say, oh my gosh, this completely transforms the way I write code. And if you haven't had that epiphany yet, go write more and more and read more because I promise you when that moment happens, it's going to transform your coding experience. And learn about things like law of Demeter and loose coupling and separation of concerns. And what I mean is not just doing what CodeIgniter taught me object-oriented programming was, which was take all your methods, your functions, and wrap them up in a library that has functions and methods that are 500 lines long and all that kind of stuff. Learn actual OOP, true OOP. Also, check out design patterns. Design patterns are basically when, as a community, we say, here's a particular way of addressing something, usually in code, that we are doing on a regular basis. We're doing it over and over again. Let's give a name for it, and let's identify when it works well and when it works poorly and when we shouldn't use it. Okay, learn these, because basically we've been coding, people have been coding and developing and programming in some shape or form for decades at this point. And not to learn from the things that we as a community have recognized, hey, we're doing this over and over again, is to waste our time. Um, a few design patterns that you may have heard of before, then, and you might not even know their design patterns, Adapter, Singleton, Observer, and there's a lot more available for you. And also architecture patterns. If you've spent any time in the PHP or in the Laravel community, you've heard DDD come up, you've heard hexagonal architecture come up, you've heard other things, and these are kind of like design patterns at a much top, much higher level. Okay, these are architectural. Um, so again, I just threw a whole bunch of words at you, and a lot of you are going to say, "Oh, I know all those. I'm a pro at those. You probably know better than I do. That's great." But that's not all of us. And so I want us all to kind of like start getting up to the same common level. Like learn how to be a good coder. Not Laravel, not PHP. Become a good coder who understands these basis practices, and it's going to transform the way you write code. Number two, learn from Laravel specifically. And this is, I'm going to say this, learn from Laravel. There's a lot of great learning resources in Laravel. For example, Laracasts. I think that Jeffrey Way is the best teacher on the internet. I don't know Jeff. I know he's a great guy. I'm sure he is. But I, have, I came to Laravel primarily because he, who I respect so much, said it was awesome, okay? He, we don't understand and value the resource we have in this guy. I'm sorry, you know, like I'm talking about, but if you're not subscribed to Laracast, you are doing yourself a disservice. Every single day you're gonna learn something. It's not just about Laravel, it's about PHP, it's about design, it's about JavaScript, grunt, gulp, whatever. <laughs> Sign up, watch it on your lunch break every day. You will not regret it. Number two, read the books. Dale Reese has a really great introduction to Laravel book called Code Bright. Taylor has a really great book called From Prentice to Artisan that is a, kind of how he thinks about structuring large-scale applications. Chris Fidao implementing Laravel, also his thoughts about scaling large-scale um, large uh, applications, and there's a lot of other books available in the Laravel uh, infrastructure. And there's a lot of other non-Laravel books. We'll get to those soon. Um, go read the PSRs. If you're not familiar with PSR, there's a thing called the Framework Interoperability Group where the leaders of all these different PHP frameworks got together and said, let's stop fighting over these things. Why don't we agree we all do these things the same way? You can agree with disag or disagree with their motives. Rather than talking about what's best, they just kind of voted. And so if there's something where it's like 17 to 18, the 18 won, even though 17 of the people thought it was a terrible idea. So we get a little bit of issues. For example, Laravel doesn't quite follow the PSR2 coding standards because we have tabs instead of spaces, and we have control, stru control structure braces on new lines instead of the same line, whatever. It causes a little bit of trouble, and we move on with our days. But if you haven't read them, if you don't know what they are, then you don't know what consensus within the PHP community looks like, and that's hurting you. So go read them, go understand what they are. If you're really excited about it, go read the proposed ones as well. There's one for cache, there's a couple other ones. But right now, we got PSR 0, read and forget, PSR 1 and 2, code styles, PSR 3, caching, and PSR 4, autoloading, which you absolutely need to know and understand. And then IRC, like it's 1999. And yes, IRC, that same thing you remember the dorky kids doing in high school, or you were the dorky kid doing in high school, is still a thing. Laravel, Laravel off topic, and you can hang out in those places and you can never have written a line of Laravel code in your life, and that's fine, that's not a problem. I joined those long before I actually could do any real uh, Laravel projects because it wasn't my day job. Um, and it basically looks like this when you're in IRC. I just want you guys to watch how amazing it is to be working in IRC. Just, I'm gonna let it loop once or twice so you can just see. That's, that's what you feel like when you're IRC, you're like leet hacks or. So another one is read the source. Laravel framework is available, Illuminate is available, maybe some dragons, 
read through, and, and it can seem overwhelming when someone tells you to read the source, so pick something you're interested in. I am really interested in how Laravel does cache. It's really fantastic. I've dealt with cache in the past. It's really annoying. Go read through the cache Illuminate component. Just spend a lunch break and understand how the Illuminate component for caching works. And don't think about anything else. And anything you don't get, write it down and be like, oh, I need to understand how service providers work. Okay, great, figure that out. But just read that. And then the next time, read Session. And the next time, read Eloquent. Piece by piece, you're going to learn about Laravel, but you're also going to learn about coding. And it's going to be really uh, valuable for you as a developer. Step three, modernize the foundation. So up till now, we're just learning, right? We're just learning. It doesn't have anything to do with a particular project. But now let's talk about this project we're working on. Modernize the foundation of your code base. And this has nothing to do with Laravel again, but we can learn it from Laravel. Get some code standards. Decide what your code standard is. I suggest if you're writing in Laravel or you're going to be using Luminate components, you consider Laravel's PSR2-ish, which is PSR2 tabs, uh, braces on new lines for control structures. But if not, that's fine. Use PSR2, whatever. There's a lot of tools available to us to help us understand when we are following those rules and also to help us fix our code to follow those rules. So for example, there's something called PHP Code Sniffer. You can run it from a command line. You can plug it in at Sublime Text. Phil Sturgeon has a great blog post on that. It's built into um, PHP Storm by default. And it gives you little squigglies or little alerts or warnings or whatever you want when you don't follow those standards. So when you're writing new code, automatically gives you crap when you're not doing. Also, there's something that um, I can't pronounce his name, so Fabpot um, did called uh, PHP CS Fixer that theoretically automatically applies uh, PSR2 or whatever else you want to your code base iteratively through the whole thing. I've never tried it, but I've never done anything that he's done that's not good, so I imagine it would be very valuable. And then there are also a lot of SASs like uh, Scrutinizer that actually help you automatically run things like PHP CS and PHP Mess Detector against your code every time you commit to GitHub. We'll talk about that soon. Stay classy. So first, even though I gave Code Igniter crap, if you've got a whole bunch of random global functions and globals everywhere, of course, the first thing you want to do is get them into classes. Even if they're poorly organized classes, at least get them to be in methods on classes. You want to get rid of globals, you want to get rid of global functions, and you want to get rid of includes. And then, so as we can see here, you move them to methods on classes, and then you move them to actual design OOP, and then you can use namespaces and auto-loading. If you're not familiar about those, the next slide is for you. What you want to do is get to the point where you get rid of all your include once, all your requirements, everything like that, and everything lives in classes that are namespaced, that are being loaded via some format. I would highly suggest PSR4 and, auto lo um, and Composer Autoloader. If you're not familiar, go Google all those things. It's going to be very clear, or go see how Laravel does it. Um, and finally, uh, bug-driven testing. And this is basically um, when you have an existing code base with zero tests, uh, it's very, very difficult to write tests for that code base. So the trick is, every time a bug comes up, go write a test that fails that says, this is how the bug should be fixed. So if the bug is, this is red, uh, this should be red and it isn't, go write a test that says, this is red. So it's going to fail. Now write code until it's red, and then you're done. So every single time you fix a bug, you ensure that that bug's never going to happen again because your tests cover it, and you just add in a new test to your code base. And piece by piece by piece, you introduce tests into your code base. Finally, I have another slide deck. It's on speaker deck, and you can grab this. this. I'll put this one up on speaker deck later, and it's called Why Modern PHP is Amazing and How You Can Use It Today. And it's this first 10 minutes of the talk expanded out to a 45-minute talk. So a lot more introduction to those things, more links. So go check it out if this is all new to you. Moving on, compose all the things. So Composer is a dependency manager for PHP. So if you ever use RubyGems, if you ever use Node Package Manager, if you use Bower, anything like that, we have that now for PHP. It's amazing. If you've ever used Laravel, you're familiar with it. If you haven't, basically it allows you to set a single file that defines what your dependencies are for your, your project and then automatically pull it in on any server and it'll handle the dependencies and making sure they play nicely and error if your version numbers don't line up and everything. There's a site called Packagist, packagist.org, where you can go search for packages. So if you're looking for something, for example, for AWS, you go to Packagist, you type in AWS, you pick the package you like, probably go for the one with the most downloads, and then you add it to your composer.json, and then you update your composer, and all of a sudden, you've got AWS available to you. Composer almost always uses PSR4, so the moment you do that, if you're using the PSR4 autoloader and composer, within a couple minutes, you basically have this AWS class, or AWS class available and ready for you to use. Um, on packages, there's a lot of community packages. You've got Symfony packages, which we use a lot of in Laravel. You've got the PHP League, which is a couple of folks, including uh, Frank de Younga, trying to put together high quality packages just for PHP in general. You've got a lot of other people doing stuff on their own, and you can actually also use your own packages. You put them up on GitHub, and Composer allows you to say, this isn't from packages, this is from my own little GitHub repo, and you can even authenticate your local Composer install against your private repos if you want, and so you can have your own little private Composer world that's just for you or just for your company. Next step is illuminating your project. So 
Illuminate packages, remember, that's the unique one, and you actually have to have Laravel up and running usually to use these. And somebody asked yesterday, how do I use Illuminate in my project? And I thought, ooh, ooh, me, ooh, me. But that's okay, because you're here now. So the, some of the commonly requested ones, you can see I've got a little light one along the side there, but commonly requested are using Eloquent elsewhere, using config, using cache, using session, um, using the support, which means kind of like a collection, some of the array helpers and that kind of stuff, and using pagination because Phil Sturgeon. Um, <laughs> Oh, and there's a lot more. Um, so I created a project. So what I want to do is give you guys a couple code samples. But what I found was it's very overwhelming to me to feel like in the, the span of this very short talk, I was going to teach you everything there is to, do, to know about using Illuminate packages elsewhere. So I created a GitHub project called Illuminate non Laravel, And what it is is trying to have a single use case for each Illuminate package. And from A to Z, you just copy this code. Hopefully, you refactor it later. But you copy this code, drag it into whatever project you're working in, and instantly you have this Illuminate package working in your project. So right now, we have database, support, cache, config, IOC container, and routing. And we've got a lot more that we want to work on. But right now, any of those, if you're interested in having them in your project, you can go copy this code right now. And I would love, if you have experience with them with some of those things, for you to come and contribute some of the other ones. But my hope is in the next month or two, we'll have all of them up and running, and then hopefully contribute them back to the docs. So I'm going to show you a couple of those, and there's kind of three different stages of what it looks like to bring these in. So the simplest is no dependencies. So in composer.json, we require illuminate.support, and then we, in we install it. So we have it. We require the autoloader for composer. So now composer is going to pull in all those classes automatically for us. We don't have to do any includes or requires. And then we just create a new collection. And if you have never used collections before, they're like arrays on steroids. Um, they just give you a lot of this additional ability on arrays, like each and all it filters and maps and all this kind of stuff. And I just used it. That was it. All I had to do was bring in the code, new it up, and use it. And that's it. That's the simplest possible way to do it. Intermediary is using the capsule. So a lot of them weren't that simple, but Phil Sturgeon, Dan Hargan, Taylor, a few other folks created something called the capsule that basically makes it easier to use primarily eloquent in other settings. So you create a capsule, which is this nicely encapsulated container, and then you just pass it some information. I'm passing it some database information here. I boot eloquent, and now I can create eloquent models. I can use eloquent just like normal. That's all it takes. Um, finally, the most complicated one is actually bootstrapping Illuminate. And what I mean by that is actually creating an application container, actually spinning up service providers, actually spinning up aliases. This is the simplest possible way to do it. It's actually missing one piece, which I'll tell you in a second. Um, so you create your container. You initiate service providers, which are the ways basically in Laravel that we spin up. Um, uh, like if you have a lot of stuff at the beginning that's going to spin up uh, your caches, and you can't use cache until that runs, you run that in the cache service provider or the session service provider or whatever. Um, and then we are also going to alias and, uh, and facade some things. And the one thing that's missing here is um, you see this loop in the middle with for each and register. You have a second loop that does the exact same thing and boots them. Uh, not all of them need that boot, but you should do it just in case. Um, so once you have this, you now have app that you can use anywhere in your app, just like you would use app in a Laravel app. You can use it as an IOC container. You can use it to resolve dependencies. You can use it um, to pass in to some of the more complicated Illuminate components that require an app instance. So just with this, we now have the foundations. And sometimes you have to add more, all sorts of configuration settings stuff. We have the foundations of an actual bootable Illuminate kind of container that can be used to inject in these other ones. Um, there's still a lot left. We've had at least this many plans, session, pagination, HTTP queue, mail, validation, translation, and artisan. But there's more plan. There's more than that. And so if you guys have the ability to contribute to this, that would be really valuable. Uh, six, get sassy. SAS is software as a service. So if you ever use something like for example, SendGrid, Mailgun, or Mandrill, anything like that, um, those are SASs. And what SAS does is, so with Composer before, they were giving us code that somebody else wrote, but we're still running it. We're running the infrastructure, right? With a SAS, they're actually taking care of the infrastructure as well. So we're basically paying them to run some other server, to run some other curve, to main, uh, 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 code, maintain dependencies, all that kind of stuff, and we pay them X amount of money per month to handle that for us. So rather than you having to deal with send mail or the client who says, I didn't get the mail, and I'm like, well, I sent the mail, uh, just disappeared in the ether. Um, I send an API request off to SendGrid, Mailgun, Mandrill, whoever, and they say, I got the API request, I tried to send it, it bounced back for this reason, I've got all the logs, they handle it, they make sure I'm not blacklisted, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
there's a lot of other, other, other SaaSes, but you can start to see the value of bringing these things in. You pay them 10 bucks a month, 150 bucks a month, whatever ends up being. Um, and so we've got some others. We've got, for example, handling your logs. If you don't want to SSH into 15 different servers to see what your logs look like, Paper Trail can combine it together in one place. Or if you actually want to know when your users get an exception and they get a white screen of death and you know, they just aren't happy, you use something like Bugsnag or you can locally install Sentry. And then every single time an exception happens, it gets logged and you see their IP address, what browser they're in, what their session looked like, how many times it happened, how often it happened, when it started happening, all this kind of stuff. You see a stack trace, it's fantastic. There are SASs devoted to helping you improve your code quality. Scrutinizer, Sensio Labs Insights, and Code Climate all let you submit your code on every GitHub push, and then they do analysis on it. So Scrutinizer runs pre-existing command line things that you can run for free. Scrutinizer makes it easier. But Sensio Labs Insights and Code Climate both actually have their own intelligent insight that they wrote that is specifically only available by using their services. They're expensive. Your results may vary, um, but it's worth at least taking a look at. And then finally, continuous integration and deployment. Um, so there's a few different options for this. Um, if you're not familiar with it, basically what this means is every single time I push up to GitHub, do some things. Depending on whether it's integration or deployment, those things will be different. You know, sniff my code, run my tests, maybe even push to my production server or push to my staging server or whatever. But basically, set up a list of rules and do all these things. So it's kind of like someone else, if you write a very complicated, very powerful Envoy script and then somebody else runs it for you every single time you push to GitHub. So Codeship is kind of becoming more than one of the more well-known ones within the PHP world. Um, Jenkins and Travis are older um, and used in different contexts. And then Semaphore and Scrutinizer are kind of, Semaphore is a, a Rails one that just added PHP support. And Scrutinizer does a million things, and they say that CI is one of them, but I've never tried it before. So next, using Laravel as a component. So um, you don't always have uh, the requirement that you can't rewrite the whole thing in Laravel. Or, well, so let's. You want to get as much Laravel in as possible, assuming you have this kind of th this moment at the beginning that I did where it's, well, why can't I just rewrite the thing in Laravel? So often you've got to sneak in little pieces, but sometimes you might be able to chop off an entire piece of your existing app and replace it with a Laravel app or whatever else, but let's say Laravel for now. So Laravel's a front end. You imagine that you've got kind of two different disparate sections of your app right now. You've got this great front end and you've got this terrible back end or a terrible or front end and great back end. And so Laravel's a front end. You imagine basically chop off your existing front end that's written in whatever, you know, include mess or whatever. And you say, okay, great. We kind of have an interface between the back end, which holds the data and the front end, which consumes the data. Let's chop off the front end, write a Laravel app that consumes that same data and leave the back end as it is. Or the other way around. You have this really well written front end, it's templated well, it might be in Twig or whatever, but then this back end is this mess of legacy data stores and stuff like that. Well, again, there's kind of an API between them, right? They, they, they communicate using a certain amount of methods, certain amount of resources, or whatever. Great, chop off the back end and write a Laravel app that provides the same thing to the front end. And so often you would do this when you are in some kind of circumstance where there's already a little bit of delineation, for example, like a CMS. So if you're using something like um, and this is true for new projects as well. Using like a craft CMS, an expression engine, a Drupal or whatever, especially if they're one where the templating and the data stores are different, it's actually really valuable to consider doing this going forward. So for example, craft CMS is a really fantastic CMS based on Yi, and Yi is very, very similar to Laravel. It's very modern. Um, and they have this really, really great ability to spin up data management places basically for your users where they log in and they manage their data and there's WYSIWYGs and there's drop downs and it's just all the stuff that like building it in Laravel and Bootstrap sometimes might be too much work. But you might need more control than Craft gives you in terms of the front end templating architecture all that kind of stuff. Well that's great. Write a Craft database or Craft backend, have your clients log into that and then use Laravel to actually put the front end. So maybe Laravel can write, you can write some eloquent models that directly read the Craft databases. Maybe you use a Craft plugin to generate a RESTful API and then Laravel is going to consume that, whatever. You now don't have to build all that amazing backend drag and drop functionality and kind of stuff, and especially for people who aren't front end developers, not having to build really pretty backends might be something that's valuable for you. And my friend Matt Green just recently did this. He built this really massive craft backend, and then it basically opens up a little bit of its data, and then the whole front end of the site is using Laravel and caching and all this kind of amazing stuff in a way that he wouldn't have been able to do with craft. But he's a single developer for a very large organization. He wouldn't have built, be able to build this beautiful backend that craft provides him if he was just using Laravel and Bootstrap. And there's another friend I have called Anthony Colangelo. He works at Happy Cog, and he worked for MTV last year on their... Um, 
I think they're music awards voting, and so what they tried to do was move this big aspect of voting online. And it's video streams and millions and billions of hits and all this kind of stuff. And so he was tasked with figuring out how are we going to make this work. And so initially, the first thing he did was, well, I don't want MTV logging into my crappy, you know, bootstrap thing I threw together. So he created a craft site, hit the database, wrote eloquent models against all the craft database structures, and then used Laravel to read them. But then it ended up getting a lot bigger. And so this is actually what he ended up with. And you can see the link to his speaker deck all about how he did this. And it's really fantastic and worth a read. But you can see op auth for authentication, MTV's actually front end site. We've got Redis for handling all the votes and all the traffic. We've got a craft database, which is the actual content. We've got a WordPress database, which is a blog. All that stuff's happening in the back end. And then Laravel is consuming all of it and presenting this nice, beautiful, neatly managed front end to the end user. So this is something that can be really powerful when you don't say, oh, and it might not even be a good fit to use Laravel for everything, but that doesn't mean Laravel wasn't going to fit for this project. It just plays nicely in this infrastructure. And even if you're stuck with Expression Engine, I'm sorry, but there are tools to do this as well. Deep is a set of eloquent models for Expression Engine's table structure. Um, Open API and uh, export it are plugins for generating a REST API based on your current existing um, Expression Engine structure. So again, get the data out nice and clean, write a Laravel app that consumes it and actually presents the front end. So this is the hardest part of my talk. This is where I try to pronounce something in Dutch. Conclusie? Yeah. Close? OK. I'm going to reveal something to you guys that I've never told anybody else but my company before, as if this is some big secret. Every time I write a blog post on my blog, the last section says conclusion, and conclusion is always in a different language. So conclusion will be in you know, Yoruba or Swahili or whatever. And people are often like, well, what is that word doing there? I'm like, ha, ha, ha. I just revealed my secret to you and anybody who watches the video. But I felt it was only fitting to do it in Dutch for this video. So now that I spent 20 minutes on the slide. Understand why you're here. Why are you at Laravel? Why did you spend the money to come here? Why are you in the Laravel community? Why are you considering switching from where you were before? Or why have you already put all the time into this infrastructure that you have? There's got to be a reason. There's got to be a value. And we talked about it before. Uh, what is it that brought you here? And it's not just this handsome mug right here. Oh, of course, that's a thing as well. Um, but, and then bring that incrementally to your legacy apps or to your new apps that can't be all Laravel or whatever else it ends up being. So remember, undercover Laravel, sneaking in piece by piece, talking about OOP and designer architecture patterns, really understanding how to do our code well. We're talking about modernizing our code base, so bringing in coding standards, bringing in auto-loading, classifying everything, you know, getting classy, um, auto-loading, Composer, all that, PSR4. Um, bringing in packages through Composer. Use Symfony components, use PHP lead components, use other uh, community components, use Illuminate components. It is possible. Get sassy. Don't, recognize, don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel that somebody else already did. Send your mail out to a SAS. Send your queues out to a SAS. Send your logs out to a SAS. Let somebody else take care of that for 50 bucks a month so you can do the stuff that uniquely you can do. Okay? And then Laravel's a component. Consider taking an entire chunk of your existing app and making it Laravel. I have a few additional resources here. Um, modernizing legacy applications in PHP. If you've ever read it before, you'll recognize that the first probably fifth of my talk was very much like that because he and I do a lot of the same things day to day. Take existing legacy applications and bring them into the modern world. It's a really fantastic book. It was actually based on a talk he did at Nashville PHP, which was called, it was like that when I got here. So if nothing else, go watch that 45 minute talk. And it's all about modernizing, you know, basically saying, oh, there's, you know, include mess here, there's globals here. It's talking about how we can bring that into the modern world. Um, there's also another book that I have not read, but I've had recommended so many times that I'm embarrassed I haven't read, which is Working Effectively with Le Legacy Code, which from what I understand is this at a much larger scale, not just PHP. Refactoring, which is kind of quintessential how to refactor code, which is whether your new code or your old code, any code is worth refactoring. And then um, I like this book. I think this is very good for someone who's never interacted with object orientation like really as a deep concept before, a Mastering Object Oriented PHP by Brandon Savage. Now there's a lot of fantastic 500 page long books that are much deeper treatises on the concepts of OOP. This is a nice, easy read, 75 or 100 pages that gives you the basics. So if you're new, go there. If you're a pro already, you're good, it's going to be old hat, but there, and there's some other better stuff. But this is a really good place to get started, especially because a lot of the best books available are going to be really massive. And finally, Compelling action slide. This was a placeholder that was supposed to, to tell me what I was going to do, but I was just so happy with this and what this was. I'm going to leave this here. So, and, and I actually have a black jacket and I have gray jeans and I have a white t-shirt and I was so close to doing this entire talk dressed up like the funds just so this last slide would make you laugh a little bit more and I didn't, but you're laughing anyway, so I'm happy. So basically what I want you guys to do is understand what is bringing you here, what is Laravel bringing, and how can you bring that everywhere. Don't let the fact that you're sitting here saying, I'm waiting for a next project that I can do Laravel on. I'm waiting for my boss to give me permission. I'm waiting forever. Don't let that stop you. 
bring it to your current projects, bring it to your old projects, or go do some you know, freelance stuff on the side, or go do some open source stuff on the side, but don't let something stop you. You have the ability right now to learn, to program, to practice, to go try this out on every code base available to you, and nothing is stopping you. So that's it. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you.